Welcome uh, tonight. Uh, welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is our, our midweek service for Greater House Church of Chester and Osmeport. If you'd like to join with us, feel free uh, and feel welcome. If this is the first time you found us or, or um, discovered us, it's um, also available at our website, which is ggechurch.co.uk. And also you can find us on our Facebook uh, page, GGE Church, and on YouTube, which is uh, Greater Grace Evangelical Church. So any of those um, avenues are available for you to uh, find us, get in touch with us as well. If you are watching as well, and you're able to he hear and see clearly, then please leave us a message, leave us a comment, so that we know that uh, people are able to see. Um, that would be great. Um, just so that we know that someone is able to, to see us tonight. Uh, in a moment we'll be opening God's Word as we usually do on a, a Wednesday evening. Uh, just for a, another few thoughts from God's Word. Uh, and then uh, we'll uh, just give this time to the Lord now in prayer. Uh, we just trust Him for everything. Um, so let's pray now and um, let's see what God does with the evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We praise you now and we worship you. Thank you, Lord, that you are the God of all things. You are the God of our needs. You are the God of our fears. You are the God of our uh, supply, Lord. You take every burden. You take every worry and every care. You are the God who forgives. You are the God who heals. You are the God who loves Lord, we thank you that your love is not just sentimental, patting people on the back. Uh, your love is a love that changes us, challenges us, Lord. And we thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for your heart towards us. Thank you for uh, the fact that you came to be amongst us. Thank you, Lord, that you went through everything that we go through. And thank you, Lord, that you went to the cross for us. And Lord, we want to worship you tonight. We want to lift up the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that you paid the price for us. Uh, fill us with your spirit now, Lord, we ask. We are nothing of ourselves. We are weak and uh, we need your help. We need your direction. We need your filling, Lord. Anoint with your Holy Spirit. Uh, guide us tonight as we open your word. Uh, and just give us something that is directly from you, Lord. Uh, we trust you and we love you. Uh, lead us now in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, okay, so um, tonight we're going to look at um, Romans chapter 11. <clears throat> and it says there, in what verse 1 I say then hath God cast away his people God forbid for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew what ye not what the scripture saith of Elias how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and digged down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise works is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it. 
and the rest were blinded. Okay, we'll leave it there for now. Uh, let's pray again. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this time. We pray that you would just uh, lead us, guide us, uh, fill us with your life. Uh, give your wisdom, Lord, in everything that we pray. Uh, anoint our evening, Lord, we ask. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And thank you for your truth in everything, Lord. Guide us now, we pray. Encourage us, Lord. Heal us. Fill us. Renew us. And use this time for your purpose, Lord. Uh, you have a purpose tonight for us. And we trust you, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you would just use it for your perfect will. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. So. Tonight. Uh, thinking about that. A remnant according to the election of grace. That's a great thought, isn't it? Uh, we sometimes maybe feel that... Uh, we are a minority, maybe we don't feel that we're very significant, maybe we don't feel that our church is very big. Um, I heard a, a story recently of a, a church that uh, didn't think it was worth opening because they could only have 30 people in, the, in their room, and you're thinking, well, our whole church is about 30 people, so it would never be worth us opening. Uh, but uh, <laughs> you know what? Uh, you know, God doesn't look on the on those things, on the on the size, uh, on the uh, on the ability. No, uh, you know what? He looks with eyes of grace. That's it. The 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 uh, the election of grace. Uh, there is also a remnant according to the election of grace. That is our, our theme for tonight. Um, and it's interesting because we we come here at this chapter. Uh, very key um, season in the book of Romans where Paul is talking about the Jews and the Jewish nation and the purpose that God has for the Jewish nation and the history that God had with the Jewish nation uh, the nation of Israel, his chosen people his covenant people but how you know that has now uh, changed because of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah coming, being rejected by them, but not all of them there's a remnant there's a remnant according to grace. And uh, think about this as well. Paul has argued from the very beginning um, for the grace of God to be shown to the Gentiles. Paul was really the great apostle to the Gentiles. Um, initially, all of the uh, other disciples of Jesus, as they went out, they went uh, to the uh, the Jews, different parts of, of the nation of Israel, and then the diaspora, as um, the because of the, 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 the plundering of the um, and destruction of the temple, uh, and a lot of the, the Jews uh, fled from Jerusalem, um, ended up in various parts of the empire. Uh, the Jews were very dispersed. But actually people went, and Paul did the same thing initially. He went to find those that were in the synagogues in, in Asia Minor and in Greece and wherever they were originally um, to preach to them because they had a knowledge of who God was. So there was a starting block, a foundation, a common ground. But then actually what happened was that Gentiles also were getting saved. And in some cases the Jews were so hard against uh, the cult of Jesus as they saw it that they wouldn't be open but there were others who did so Paul went back and argued with uh, with Peter and with James argued very vehemently why for the um, the Gentiles to be opened up to the grace of God that salvation is um, you know it says salvation is of the Jews but yeah uh, it came via the Jews because of the Lord Jesus Christ being uh, born into the tribe of Judah 
but actually you know what it, it was far greater than that and uh, the Gentile the apostle to the Gentiles the champion of the Gentiles uh, is uh, uh, arguing for grace for the Gentile nations to also receive salvation from the living God because he's our God as well he's the God of the whole earth uh, now remember Peter had the great vision of the great white sheet uh, that came down from heaven and that was uh, preparing him for what was going to happen uh, with Cornelius as the Gentiles again it was opened up for them to also receive the Holy Spirit and for them to be brought into the covenant and so you know it was it was the time was right God did a special thing but then ironically here this great champion of the Gentile nations saying the grace of God is available to them also here he's talking about uh, the Jewish nation and here he's going back and saying well actually you know what uh, let's balance this out uh, because um, God is not finished with Israel and God has still has a purpose for the nation of Israel and God is not finished with his covenant people and it's like he hasn't turned his back on them you know God forbid as he says and you know and the point is again you've got to remember that Paul is from the nation of Israel himself uh, he is a Jew of the Most High uh, from the tribe of Benjamin one who could a Hebrew of the Hebrews one who could trace his ancestry back right uh, to Adam if he wanted to and somebody who had kept all the pharisaical laws and all of the the, the um, ceremonial laws and and therefore you know was considered to be a high uh, Jewish scholar and yet as he famously says you know he counts it all uh, done because you know he, he now has received something which is far greater something which is different again qualitatively different again he's received the grace of God and he's received the person of the Lord Jesus Christ as saviour and he's received the spirit of the living God and that's that's great and uh, Paul is saying hey uh, yeah no God has not given up on the Jewish nation God still has great plans for them and he does and we see that in the millennial reign and in the end times that, um, as well that um, Israel still has a key role and there are certain prophecies that are still waiting to be fulfilled towards the nation of Israel although many of them have already come to pass we still see a few things that we are waiting for uh, and that, that God will fulfill but the point is this God doesn't give up on people he doesn't give up on us he doesn't give up on any, any one of us he doesn't give up on those that he's touched he doesn't give up on our, our loved ones as well we can pray out for them uh, he, God hasn't given up on any of these things he doesn't give up on on those that are his people those that are his known his, his chosen ones now uh, verse uh, 2 it says God hath not cast away his people whom he foreknew now that's a a key word as well uh, in scripture um, I used to get all steamed up years ago about the idea of predestination because it's like I always used to think they made God out to be very cruel because God created some people who were destined, predestined already to go to heaven and then he must have other, created other people who he knew were predestined to go to hell so why did he create them because he knew that they were going to hell and that's like isn't that cruel isn't that uh, rather uh, perverse of God to do it that way but but now now you know having understood that actually you know God gives everyone freedom of choice but predestination is based on his foreknowledge as you can see that in, in a couple of chapters back in Romans in 
Romans 8 it goes through that list of things with whom he did uh, for, foreknow they, those he also predestinated so in other words you know because of God's foreknow because God knows the beginning of time from the end he's outside of time he doesn't exist in the, within time in the same way he, he exists uh, wherever we find him he, he is uh, omnipresent but he uh, but he doesn't he's also outside of time so uh, you know he has that view from start to finish looking in from outside he's able to know what will happen before it actually has happened God gives us freedom of choice. We were talking the other day about Jeroboam. It's a good question, actually, uh, isn't it? Uh, when you look at the life of Jeroboam, he was offered the kingdom. Now, he didn't take it. He didn't follow God. He was offered great promises that God would build a house for him and, uh, and, uh, and a dynasty to his name. But he didn't actually uh, follow through with that because he didn't trust God and he didn't follow him. Now you're sort of thinking, well, why did God say that? Because he must have known that he wouldn't do it. No, but God gave him the full choice, the full freedom to choose that. Now you were saying, well, obviously God knew, you know, uh, how it would how it would work out. Yeah, but you know, is that was that offer not really genuine? If God knew already, you wouldn't take it. No, but the, you know what? There's a chance that maybe God, uh, maybe God was waiting to see what happened, to see whether uh, it would play out differently. But you know, um, yeah, the choice was there. The freedom of choice was there. And uh, and it, yeah, we're getting slightly off the subject here, but but this idea, that, you know, like God doesn't cast away His people. He's not going to give up on them. He doesn't throw them aside. Uh, now, we can sometimes become a castaway. That's another uh, word that's used <laughs> in the New Testament as well, where we where we get into difficulties in sailing our ship, as it were, and become castaway. But you know what? Um, God doesn't give up on us even then. There's still a way um, back there's still grace, there's still opportunity. It's just we can make a mess of things when we when we don't follow him, we don't trust him, and we go uh, off in our own direction. Um, but you know what? Uh, yeah. God's full knowledge. God knew. Uh, and it says, you know, uh, I have not given up on my people. I still have a plan for them. And it goes on here, and it says, "What you, what you're not, as or, as you know, that's the old word for no, isn't it? No, you're not. What the scripture says of Elijah, how he maketh intercession for God against Israel. Now, the really funny thing was, I, I studied this out because I wanted to study um, this verse in Romans about the." That was what the verse that God gave me was about, um, according to the election of grace. And I was thinking very much about the difference between grace and works. And verse, verse six that we read as well there, you know, that interplay that actually, you know, if we're saved by grace, it can't be our works. And if we're saved by works, then it can't be grace because the two are mutually exclusive. It's either one or the other. It's either our efforts and our goodness and our thing, or it's God's grace. Because if it's partly one and partly the other, it doesn't work. If it's partly earned, then it's no longer freely grace. And if it's if it's uh, if it's only partly uh, by grace, then it, you know it, it, it <laughs> if it you know like with that, that there would have to be works involved. And, but if it, it you know it, it, actually the works would be invalidated as well if it if there's grace involved you know it's like one or the other it has to be otherwise otherwise work is not work anymore you know and so uh, you know it's interesting because I was talking to somebody about Mormonism uh, 
that's really what uh, why I had that on my mind. Uh, but then the, the the really weird thing is that yesterday in the morning I'd been reading about Elijah, and then the funny thing is when I came to study this passage, I noticed that the verses in, at the beginning of the chapter, as we read out, is about Elijah, and it was exactly the story that I'd been reading that, that same day. How actually, after Mount Carmel, uh, Elijah is all scared because um, there's been a great victory, and God has, has turned back the nation to himself by his loving kindnesses, by doing miracles, by showing that he's a faithful God, that he hasn't abandoned Israel, by giving them rain again after the season of drought, by fire from heaven uh, doing a miracle to show that he has the power and that he will answer when his servant calls upon him. Uh, that's what that's about. It's like, hey, look, you can pray to me and I will answer. These other gods, they don't answer. Uh, and the prophets of Baal have been... Uh, have been uh, shown up to be completely false but of course those people who are very much behind that whole industry of Balaam and again you know idolatry there's always an industry involved Jezebel was really behind it she threatens him and says well you know I'll, I'll, I'll kill you you won't survive uh, um, and, uh, and so Elijah runs away hides in a, in a cave and uh, but God meets him and it's funny because these uh, these verses here in uh, verses 2 um, 2, 3 and 4 that literally are taken from the passage that I was reading in the morning which is in 1 Kings 19 uh, it's funny if you look there at verse um, read verse 9 and 10 it says there uh, and he came thither into a cave and lodged there and behold the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him what doest thou here Elijah and he said I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain the prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now think about that. Sometimes maybe we feel like that way. We feel very jealous for the cause of the Lord and we, uh, you know, we get uh, uh, excited about something or passionate about something and this is what was happening with with with, uh, with Elijah and, and God sort of comes along and said hey well calm down don't worry about it it's okay you know I've, I'm in, in control of this um, but you know Elijah is all all worked up and it's like yeah and they and the, the thing is like they got rid of so many uh, the prophets have been killed the altars are torn down everything that relates to god is being uh, uh, there's no respect for god anymore and there's no no nothing going on here and actually i'm the only one left and they even want to take my life in other words this is the last remnant and once they remove that there won't be anybody and it, that's what um, uh, that's what Elijah is sort of feeling here. It's like if I don't take a stand for the living God, there won't be anybody who does, because I'm the only one left. And to be fair to Elijah, he had stood alone on Mount Carmel. Um, there were 450 prophets of Baal. 450. There we go. I did check it. Actually, we were talking about that whether it was 850 or 400. But anyway, um, 450 uh, prophets of Baal against him. Now, that's not a good ratio, is it? Um, if it was democracy, we wouldn't be doing very well with it. But 
thankfully it wasn't because God was the one who was going to clearly show that he was in control and uh, and God does this time and time again in our lives that even though the odds look against us and it looks terrible and it doesn't look fair and it doesn't look right God is in control and he will come through and uh, <laughs> Elijah is scared that he's the only one that, that's left there now what happens next in that story um, and it says uh, and he said go forth and stand upon the mountain before the Lord and behold the Lord passed by and a great strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord but the Lord was not in the wind and after the wind an earthquake but the Lord was not in the earthquake and after the earthquake a fire but the Lord was not in the fire and after the fire a still small voice and so it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave and behold there came a voice unto him and said what do we stay here Elijah and wow so yeah Elijah's all worked up Elijah's worried and God says well you know I'm going to show you something I'm going to show you uh, three natural disasters and actually you know what when we're all worked up and worried about something uh, three natural disasters are always very good to put our things into perspective aren't they it's like you know uh, we sort of you know we get all bend out of shape because I don't know we can't uh, find our shoes or uh, breakfast is burnt or something like that and, uh, and let me put the news on and there's been a hurricane somewhere and hundreds of people are dead and it's like oh isn't it terrible and it, and it puts our it puts our our own little worries and our own concerns into perspective doesn't it it's good to have a bigger view on things but you know what it's like God does this, there's the whirlwind, there's the earthquake, and there's the fire. Uh, and what does it do? It takes, it takes Elijah's focus off himself for a minute and puts it back on God and says, Hey, well, you know what? A minute ago, or a day ago, I was there and I was calling down fire from heaven. And this is the God who can do these great things, these incredible things it's like there's all going to be all sorts of things but you know it's only a blessing if God is in it there's no God in the in the whirlwind there's no God in the earthquake there's no God in the fire but actually in the still small voice then that's when God is ready to speak and God's going to do something and God gives him a, actually jobs to do he gives him a to-do list he comes back and he he deals with these same issues as before, but he, you know he he has a he has a to do list for him. He this is oh, now you're ready to now I've got your attention now you're ready to listen to me. Actually, uh, let's let's do this. Uh, now, for a minute, let's consider this. Uh, whirlwind, an earthquake, and fire. Now, in Second Kings chapter two, um, we see there that one of the things that, he, uh, that uh, Elijah is told to do is to anoint somebody to replace himself. He gets to anoint two kings to replace kings, uh, one in Syria and one in Israel. But he also gets to anoint his own successor. And it's like there's somebody else who's going to take over. It's going to be Elisha. God tells him who. And uh, and it's like yes. So, but then the interesting thing is in uh, in Second Kings, chapter two. This is where Elijah is going to heaven. And if somebody was saying. I think it was even Pastor Shallow was saying the other day. You know, oh, I always get confused between Elijah and Elisha. And I was thinking. No, it's not that hard, really, because you know Elijah. Elijah's the hairy one. He's got lots of hair, and then and 
Elisha is the bald one. Um, that's what the scripture tells us. So, you know, I think that's quite easy to tell them apart, really, isn't it? Uh, so, yeah, Elijah is going to heaven, and Elisha is going to see it. But then, what? look what happens here. It says uh, in verse 11, I think it is. Yeah, let's read verse 10, actually. It says, and he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing, nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall be not so. And it came to pass, as they went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven and Elisha saw it and he cried my father my father and the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof and he saw him no more and he took hold of his own clothes and rent in two pieces Wow. Now, now think about this in a way. What has God done there? He's taken Elijah to heaven. But how has he done it? He's done it by a whirlwind and by fire. Wow. Now that's two of the things that actually was happening. What's happening there? Now you might say, well, there's no earthquake in my book. Let's not worry about that for now. But you know, two of these, the things that the, the the things that actually God showed him before He spoke to him. It's like you know, oh, you know, I'm all worried about things and how is it going to happen? What's going to happen after me? When I'm gone, who's going to do? You know, there won't be anybody after I'm gone. If they kill me, you know, uh, there won't be anybody left. Interestingly. Elijah he even sort of says Lord take my life you know which is crazy because it's like well you're worried about being killed um, but then the, the other funny thing about that is that what does God do he takes him to heaven directly so it, not only does God protect him from being murdered by Jezebel not only does he protect him from taking his own life but actually he's one of the only two people in scripture and in history who never die. So, <laughs> so rather than it, it's like God sort of saying, oh, you're worried about dying. Well, actually, you know what? You're not going to die. You're not ever going to die. You know, you're going to be one of the few people who will never actually die. And it's like, wow, yeah, okay, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good promise from God, isn't it? You know, it's like, wow, you know, I'm going to go over and above what you think but think about this as well that those things that, that were showed to him and the cave in Mount Horeb it's like well yeah there's fire and there's whirlwind and it's like well hang on you know what God is going to use these in your life later and actually God is now warning you preparing you for something much greater that he's going to do now this might look like a tough time now and it might look like a, a big disaster in front of you and you might look and say, well, God's not in this. God's not in this whirlwind, and God's not in this fire, and God's not in that earthquake. Fine, okay. But the point is, God is preparing Elijah for something that he's going to do that will be far greater, that will have a lasting impact. You know, the very fact we're still talking about it today, you know, is a sign of you know how miraculous it was uh, Elijah was going to go directly to heaven going to be in the presence of the living God for all time wow that's pretty good going uh, and God is preparing him for something much better now think about this as well it's interesting because if you remember in Acts chapter 2 what do we read there as well it's like uh, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come they were all of one accord in one place and suddenly there came the sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind 
and filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Wow! The coming of, of, of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the Church of Pentecost. But again, what do we see there? We see a, a, a strong wind, a mighty rushing wind. Not a whirlwind as such this time, but uh, the same thing. And tongues of fire. It's the same thing that usher in the, the presence of God. Now think about this. When our Queen is about to make a speech, there are certain things that happen, there are certain protocols. In fact, the, the Queen released a statement today thanking people for her birthday wishes talking about the, the loss of her husband but there are certain issues there are certain things that are certain ways that are things are done and there are certain precedents and there are certain uh, protocols that are followed um, to get things right uh, so that, uh, this is the way that the Queen speaks to the nation and actually you know what for our God you know he has the same thing it's like this is God going to speak. So you think about it. What do we see when God is, is going to meet uh, uh, Moses on Mount Sinai? We see fire, a burning bush, and it's not consumed. Wow. What do we see with, with, with Elijah? Well, a whirlwind and fire. What do we see at Pentecost? A, a mighty rushing wind and tongues of fire. And it's what, you know, these are, are things that actually God is announcing that he is going to do something great and that he's going to speak and actually what happens is after that that's like the introduction that's like the the trumpet fanfare for the queen or like the or the shots of buckingham palace on the tv before it goes down into the the queen's speech or whatever you know it's like there's there's a certain preparation there's a certain thing that gets people ready gets their mind prepared and their hearts open uh, ready and this is what God does and, and again for Pentecost what was going to happen Peter was going to stand up and proclaim the gospel of grace to all nations to every tongue to every every part of the world and that God was going to speak and again you know what was what was happening was that actually God was going to speak to Elijah there was going to be a, a, a an important communication and that the, the, the still small voice was going to come. There was going to be the, the first, the, the whirlwind, the earthquake, the fire, but then there was going to be the still small voice. God was preparing him for what he was going to hear. And this is this is the point. Uh, <laughs> and you know what? I love it as well. God, God gave uh, Elijah assurance, didn't he? Uh, and we read that. We didn't read that in, in Kings because it's a little bit later down in the chapter first uh, kings 19 but in we read it in romans because it's closer together they've summarized the story there but he says you know what there's seven thousand people who haven't bowed the knee to baal there's seven thousand that's a good chunk there's a good uh, there's a good uh, um, portion of people here that have not gone away from God, they haven't turned their back on God and they haven't followed idols and they haven't got polluted and they haven't entered into this and what's that is it it's what we started with isn't it it's uh, the remnant according to the election of grace wow God has, a, has grace the covenant of his grace and there's going to be there's a, there's a remnant there's a preserved portion that says, hey, you know what? We're elected by grace. You know, what is it about us or what that, that means that we haven't bowed the knee? Well, it's God's grace. We could have been taken in. We could have got involved with these things. We could have worshipped Baal. We could have got, but we didn't. But it's by God's grace. But 7,000 people, there are, there are people out there 
you've just got to find that and there's always a remnant of grace wow it's always by grace You know, we said before actually uh, about this verse about the, um, grace or works. It can't be by works if it is by grace. And it can't be got by grace if it is by works. So you've got to choose one. Um, the fudge, as we were saying, as I was talking to this guy uh, recently, who was a Mormon, where they sort of say, well, we're saved by works and we're saved by grace. And you're thinking, no, you can't. The Bible makes it very clear here that you can't. And uh, there's plenty of other things we were talking about, Galatians as well, and, and the uh, you know any other gospel. But you know, no, uh, it's just simply God's grace, it's the election of grace, and that's the thing actually that there's a new covenant brought in, and that's the thing that Paul is saying here that actually you know what um, Israel now. They're under a new covenant and they're under the grace of God. And they might not like it. Maybe they want the old covenant because the old covenant made them feel special. Oh, we're God's covenant people. We're God's chosen ones and we have... He's the God of Israel. He's our God. He's not anyone else's. And it's like, well, we have that ex exclusivity. But you know what? No, actually, uh, now there's a much better covenant because it's the election of grace and now those that choose from the from the nation of Israel as Paul was one as the disciples were and as many others you look in the New Testament the majority of believers at the beginning were from the Jewish nation and even later on when there were many Gentiles also added still Jews also got saved you know and it's like well yeah this is it but it's a new covenant it's not based on keeping the law anymore. It's not based on the, the, the Abrahamic covenant. It's not based on the Mosaic law. It's not based on anything else. It's not based on uh, Ezra got, taking the people back and, and making them swear again. It's like, oh, we'll do it all right and we'll keep the laws. And no, now it's grace. And they're like everyone else. And maybe that's the thing that they didn't really like. Oh, we don't want to be like everyone else. We're set apart. We're separate special but God is saying no anybody who I laid down my life for is special anybody who I died for is special uh, everyone is precious Jew, Gentile whoever they are but they are all now under the covenant of the remnant of grace and they might not be massive numbers, it might always be a small number, it might always be a remnant, it might always feel like that. But you know what? There's always this covenant of grace that goes on forever uh, for, he, for God's chosen people. God's preserved a remnant. There's a remnant of grace, there's an election of grace. Uh, and you know what? We're part of it. If we trust Christ as Saviour. It's very simple. We just have to receive what God's done. And that is the key. That is the key to grace. Not putting ourselves forward. Not relying on what any, any, anyone else has done. But actually, just trusting and, and saying, I need you. I need you as Saviour. I need my focus to come back to you. I, I'm worried about me and my own problems, my own issues and all of these things. But actually I need to come back and say, no, Lord, you're the centre. And I trust you. And, and I love you. And I know that you have my best interest. Uh, you have saved me by your grace. And I'm thankful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you today actually for that that remnant of the election of grace, Lord, that there's always that opportunity for us to come to you wherever we're at, whatever we've done, whatever our background, whatever our history, and say, Lord, I need your grace. 
and I thank you that I'm saved by your grace. I'm not saved by my past actions, by my marriage, by my birth, my, by my heritage, by laws, by other things, by other my efforts, by my work. But it has to be only based on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It has to be only based on what you have done. And thank you, Lord, because that's a covenant that cannot be broken. It's something that cannot be undone, and it puts us on an equal footing, every one of us, before God. Yes, we're all equally sinners, but we're all equally forgiven. And the grace of God is equally available to each one of us. And we thank you, Lord, now. We worship you now. And we trust you, Lord. Fill us with your life, Lord. Fill us with your truth. Fill us with your spirit. And Lord, we pray, if there is anyone out there who's never trusted you as Savior and doesn't know what it's like to have that relationship with you as a Savior, as the anointed one, as the Messiah, but also as an intimate friend, then Lord, we just pray that this would be the time when they pray that prayer and invite you in, saying, Lord, I need you. I'm a failure. I can't make it on my own. But I trust what you've done for me. And I rely not on works, but wholly and simply on the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Well, again, it's not showing me any messages tonight. I don't know why the prob what the problem is with that, so I don't know whether there's anyone watching at all. Uh, if you have message, then that's great. I'll probably see it in a minute. Uh, but uh, take care. God bless, and see you soon. Uh, and uh, bye for now.